Thank you, Ryan. Um, Ryan's right. You'll see how this is used in some of the videos later on when introduced. This is just one of the technologies that not only we use, but as engineers we had to invent so that we could do the work that we needed to do. This is the left-hand side of that poster. You see on the left a structure sticking out of the water. When we first go offshore, we build things we set on the bottom, but as the water got deeper and deeper, we realized that that just wouldn't work. The structures got too big and impossible. We're now installing equipment at 10,000 feet of water. You know where Willowbrook Mall is? We're in water depths that are one and a half times the distance from here to the mall. We're operating ROVs two miles away from where we're working, so that gives you a sense of the scale of water depth. And as water and water got deeper, deeper and deeper, the technologies and the things that we had to engineer and build and install and operate got more challenging. Next. And finally on the right end is a structure called a SPAR. It's the last generation of structure. All of these systems, other than that most left one, are floating offshore. And so we have naval architects, marine engineers, and all that to help us do what we do. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you an animation What this is, this is an animation. We've turned the sound off. I'm going to get out of that light. I'm sorry. I can't see the screen. This is an animation of a, of a facility that Hess has just installed. We're in the middle of commissioning. We're tightening the bolts and checking all the wires and that sort of stuff. Hopefully, we'll be producing oil here in the next few weeks. But that's the helicopter landing on the top sides. That's how we get to work offshore. This is a couple hundred miles offshore and 5,000 feet of water. This is about half the water depth of the deepest water that the industry is currently working in. But it's still deep. It's a mile deep. So that structure there is where all the equipment and the facilities that clean and separate the oil and gas, that pressure it up to get it down the pipeline or compress the gas to do the same thing. Now as we go underwater, we can see that structure, that spar that's floating. Give you again the sense of scale there. That structure is 600 feet tall, right? and the water depth of four and a half thousand feet. This is an engineering drawing. So the engineers designed that hull. They came up with a concept, the idea, the shape, so that it would work, so it would float well, and it wouldn't move a lot. It would be stable, so that we could live on it. Manufacturing facilities take those drawings and convert them into hard structures. So here they've taken a plate and molded it and bent it and cut it and shaped it. Mechanical engineers design that. Civil engineers get in the middle of the structural shape. Metallurgical engineers select the materials. So we have to build it. And this is on the coast down in Corpus Christi. You see that, that little cut out there. So the first thing we do is get a civil engineer to build us a dry dock. So that's a, basically a big ditch. And then we fill the end in by the coast and empty all the water. And then we build each of those sections up in that dry dock. So we build one section at a time, that thing that you saw being assembled. Lift them up, weld them together, and then we end up with a whole structure. But to give you a sense of scale, that ring is 85 feet in diameter. That total structure with all of those rings welded together is 30 million pounds. It's just the size and the scale. Of it. So just the structure, those supports that just hold it in place is a major engineering task. But it's cool, it's high tech. And one of the neat things about the oil industry is how many times have you been to Brazil, Peter? Three times, he's a year out of college. Our industry provides enormous opportunities worldwide, technology. I mean, as you saw there, we dug the dirt out, we flooded it, dug the dirt out, and helped so now we have the top sides, and we have to build that. And that was done um, over in Louisiana. So all that structure has to be engineered, the whole configuration, the plumbing, where all those pipes, and what they do, and how they clean, and pressure, and test, and measure, and separate, and treat the oil and gas so that it can be sold and used. It has to be engineered first, and then the structure that does that is engineered. And then people have to engineer how to build the structure, and then they have to build the structure. And that's what you see here. Just 
those cranes as an engineering marvel. And making eight cranes work together in synchronization is, is an unbelievable task. When one lets down, all hell breaks loose. Excuse my French. And so those structures are just built up one level at a time. Again, we'll speed things up here for you. If you can just see the sense of those cranes and stuff, each one of those levels is about 30 feet tall to give you a sense of the sound. So now we've got to install the pipes, the things that connect the wells to the platform. First of all, we have to drill the wells. These wells are just a measly two to three hundred million dollars each to drill. It's no big deal. So imagine making a mistake drilling a well like that. That has to be engineered. So the wells are here. This structure, we're installing the pipe. There are structures, they're called plets, pipeline end terminations, and you'll see a video of those. And then those pipes are laid on the bottom. And in this case, we just laid it all the way on the bottom and left them there for a little bit. Now we have to get that spar, that big floating thing, to stay still. And so we run a mooring system like a boat, but it's a little bigger. The polyester rope's about this big around, and the chains are about like that. And those are called suction pumps. Imagine taking a Coke can and chopping the top off, and then shoving it upside down into the sand, and then letting it sit for a day or two, and then trying to pull that can out of the mud. That's what we use. It's more effective than a maker. So now it's time to install the spar. Well, that spar is so big, you can't pick it up and carry it. So we make it, in addition to do what it has to do, to install itself. It floats itself. So we tow it out with a couple of 20,000 horsepower tugboats. And then we control flood on end of it. That crane is all just doing is just holding it still and making sure it doesn't float away with the waves. But the spar itself is basically installing itself. Some guy invented that. He saw a cork with a fishing plow and watched the shape and the movement and said, you know what, I think I can make it. So here's the mooring lines being installed. The yellow is polyester, like a rope rope. And then the dark at the end of the chain is connected to those suction pumps. What's amazing is the amount of money and energy spent, that dry dock, all those facilities, they're built, sometimes not used again. That whole structure there, that temporary deck, is temporary. And it's there just to install these flow lines or pipeline. That was the structure on the bottom of the hull. What we do is we send the ROV down, the Sea Tiger, down to the bottom, and connect a rope to the end of that pipe and lift it up. Basically what we do, if, if something works, don't make it more complicated. We hang that on the side of that pole just the same way you can hang your shovels and hose and brooms up on the nails in your garage. Now it's a little stronger and bigger than your nails and the two by fours in the garage. That's basically how we install it. Now granted, when he's pulling that up, he's holding up 10 million pounds of weight. That's the tension of those pipes hanging on there. And we have uh, five of them. Now we have to install the top side. Well, that's not going to float. It's a bunch of structure and stuff. So we actually drag it on no bars, no bearings, no wheels. It's dragged on skids. Again, PSI, if you engineer a system. So that barge is a complicated barge in that it, you have to move water around. So as you drag it on, it doesn't sink one in and comes at the tip. And that's another engineering arm. So now we remove this temporary deck. And we bring out a little crane to help us pick that top size up. That crane has got two 7,000 ton cranes on the end of each of those. So 14,000 tons. How much is 14,000 tons? Those two cranes could lift all of the cars parked at Lion Stadium at once. So it solved a lot of parking problems by that time. <laughs> Do you guys want to add some words? Or So that's the tubular bell spar and subsea facilities. Um, that was conceptualized. We drilled the well and discovered the oil. Waited a while to try to figure it out because it's very challenging. But the con from the concept, the idea to building that thing and installing it was about four years. That's three and a half, four billion dollars worth of engineering and equipment at that site. Pretty major company. What we're going to do now 
want to show you a stop action video of real equipment. That's the installation of that pipeline. Now that pipeline, we install the same way you reel up your garden hose in your driveway. You know that plastic reel? You reel it and reel that pipe. We do the same thing. There's, there's our reel there. Now our reel's a little bigger than most people's reels. <laughs> that ship, to give you a sense, is 100 feet wide. 700 feet long. Cruise ships look like standby ones. This is the pipe, and that yellow thing that the camera is sitting on is that plat, that yellow structure I pointed to in the animation. And there you see them. So just the whole engineering of installing that, that vessel that installs it, those reels that reel it, the straightening machines on there that straighten that pipe after it comes off the reel. Whole technologies of installing. You can see there's all those round shapes that's sticking off the side. All of that's engineered so we can install it. So you have to have an idea of the end before you start. So here we are lifting. You see those yellow things sort of sitting up sideways? Those actually fold down and make a big surface area so it doesn't sink in the mud. But if we built it that big, we couldn't install it. So what we have to do is make those things fold up and then fold down when we get along. Bottom. Again, the civil engineer says here I've tested the soils, here's how strong it is. This is um, how big an area. All of these equipment, all the hydraulics, all the gripper systems, the, the pipe itself. A lot of times the equipment we stall in deep water, the, the highest load, the most stresses and strains it ever sees is just getting installed. Once it's installed, it's sort of its life is almost easy other than the corrosion and the life that it lived. But a lot of pipes and equipment is designed more as much for getting installed as, as working once it's there. So we, then we tie the wire to the end, and that's the last of the structure. We tie the wire to the end and then lower that pipe down to the bottom and lay it right next to where the well is on the bed. We lay those structures in 10,000 feet of water, <coughs> two or three feet of where we want them. It's just a moment. Actually, space is easy compared to a lot of this. Atmospheric pressure, 15 psi, space zero, difference of 15. Water depth that we recently installed equipped with the external pressure is 4,500 psi. Um, so that's, that's the same as our air pressure, and that's what we're dealing with. With all that fancy equipment, we get guys out there with grinders to cut pipe and do, so it's, it's amazing the mix of technologies. This is a structure that's clamped onto the pipe. See that big tent, that silver looking thing? That's an anode. Basically, it's a mix of aluminum and zinc, and it sacrifices itself so that it corrodes rather than the pipe. It's called the sacrificial anode. You put one of those every once in a while, again, materials engineers, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers get involved in all of the design of that. And that anode sitting several of them along the length of the pipe keep the pipe from rusting. So that's, that's meant to represent um, a bunch of engineers coming together, working together, not in silos, not on their own little thing, but as teams. If we tried to work independently, we'd never get anything done. We take all the basic principles, we take our passions. Um, I'll just share with you while this is finishing. There's, there's multiple tracks in the engineering field. There's the scientific track where you're studying basic concepts and fundamentals and laboratories and stuff, and that's great. Then on the other end, there's the practical guys, the guys that install things with hammers and make it work. And then in between, there's the technology development and management and all that. And there are all of those aspects in engineering. And one of the things you need to do as you, this is what you like, and I 
think this group has already said that. Go find out what your passion is and get a PhD and learn in the science and the technologies of microns and metals and electrons and all. Or is it just getting offshore and getting dirty and installing and building stuff and being responsible on, to the big stuff? And that's a decision that you have to make. Um, you guys want to speak to this or you want me to? So did you hear that all right? That's the pipe that we reeled on that radio. Those in the back, those in the front have felt the weight and the stiffness. And those in the back well. And that, I just think that's cool. If someone says, imagine walking in with a three foot piece of that where you can't hardly carry it in your office. And someone says, oh, I'm going to spool this up on a reel and tote it offshore and roll it off the back of the boat and lay it on the bottom. A bunch of people say so here So I, I'll add a little bit to what Don said here on subsea intervention. So you saw those videos of everything getting installed and it was all taken from the surface. Well, all that stuff goes on the bottom of the ocean where it's really too deep. And so that's kind of where this ROV comes into play. So basically the ROV is your way to look, touch it, and feel subsea. Okay, so here's, uh, I kind of jumped ahead of myself, so here's the various intervention methods that we have. We have scuba divers, which is kind of the latest technology. I'm sure all of you are familiar with scuba divers. There's an atmospheric diving suit, which is basically a giant metal cage that goes around the diver to prevent that 4,500 PSI that Don talked about from affecting the diver. And remotely operated vehicles like the sea type. So the reason we don't use divers is because once you get past a certain depth, the water pressure is, is too much. So here we go. Here's, uh, you can see there on the right kind of a scale on what's possible as far as diving goes. And you can see that saturation diving gets you to 1,100 feet. That's the deepest you can go without the atmospheric diving suit protecting you from the pressure. So atmospheric diving can get you to 2,300 feet. But as Don talked about, this tubular bells project, which is one of many in deep water offshore and gas, is a mile below the surface. That's over 5,000 feet. So really the only way you can look, touch, anything, subsea at that depth is with an ROV. So I mentioned the Sea Tiger here is a smaller model of what we really use in offshore oil and gas. The real ones are about the size of a car. They have 150 horsepower. They're powered from a tether from the surface and use hydraulic power. They've got two arms on them that can hold 500 pounds, just that full extension of you know, six feet from the vehicle. And they're really the workforces of the industry. Really big. They weigh about 8,000 pounds each. I said, one of the big pieces of equipment each ROV can weigh up to 8,000 pounds. Okay, so talking about the limitations of the different intervention methods, there's some benefits as well. Divers have, you know, the human brain and human senses and are in constant communication with the surface. So you can ask him questions like, what does that feel like? You know, look for this, you know, what do you think, you know, is the problem here? So the atmospheric diving suit, you still have that person, but you can see that picture on the right. He's limited on what he can do range of motion restriction, but that's the ROV kind of there in the center on the right. And like I said, it's about the size of the average car with just as much power. And then you have a whole support system behind it to lower it down the surface and allow the operators to control it. So here's a picture of the ROV working on a piece of subsea equipment. And so you can kind of get the scale from that equipment with uh, the ROV. So the ROV is about the size of much larger. That looks to be a subsea tree, which goes on top of every well we have offshore. And that's just kind of one of the applications of RVs and subsea. So I think at this point what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, you know, a little bit more about ourselves. We introduced ourselves at the beginning, but as y'all are looking forward to what you want to do and 
after high school, college maybe, and uh, engineering jobs potentially. And we're going to talk about where we are right now in our career path and where we want to go. Uh, since I've been Mike, I'm going to go ahead and start. So as I mentioned, I graduated from LSU with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, I've been working at Chevron as a subsea engine engineer, doing a lot of this work with ROVs and installing equipment. But I've been mainly in a technical role, in you know, the technical team, doing the uh, detailed engineering and science behind a lot of these systems. So what I'm looking to do in the future is go to a more hands-on role, kind of out in the field, so that I can really learn all the equipment better and see all the problems and uses of it in the field. It's kind of a, a good analogy that you all can understand and be, uh, right now, you know, it, it's like I'm a football coach that's never played football, right? So I know the game, I kind of know what's going on, and I can do certain aspects of it. But what I want to do is go play the game so that after that I can take it back, you know, to the office with those experiences of being there and kind of on the field. So it's very similar to what I'm trying to do by going into operations. Peter? So I'm also very good at LSU, and I'm on the same team as Ryan, actually, so I do a lot of the uh, detailed engineering work. I, I do like to get, uh, get hands on experience, so I'm looking to move into a more operational role where I can go offshore and operate with uh, get on a vessel and just see the equipment being installed. And one thing I'd like to emphasize is no matter where you end up in the oil and gas industry, they do a really good job of, of giving you enough training. So we have a lot of flexibility in our career paths where we want to go with that good saying that. Uh, and on top of that, we're, you know, each year we are required to do 30 days of training, uh, which really helps us own our skills as engineers. Um, one piece of advice I would give you guys is to, while in college and maybe even in high school for internships, that will give you uh, not only experience, but it will give you a better idea of what industry you want And then I'm the old guy. I, uh, I graduated in, from Sharpstown, like I said, in 1974, went up to Texas A&M. I, I didn't know there were other options for engineering. I just I worked my way through high school and, and went from that. I entered the co-op program, which is a program where basically you work every other semester to both learn and be educated and work, but to pay for things. And it was there that I discovered the oil field and discovered the manufacturing companies that, that built the equipment for the oil company. So when I graduated, I went to work for one of those companies. And I went to work in the, the biggest boom we had. It was 79 to 81. And we were just, the business was just taking any engineer they could and throwing them in any spot. And it was, and it was an amazing time. We got to learn hands on. Um, the negative, though, was uh, my boss asked me to engineer a piece of equipment, and I asked him what it was for, and he said, well, go ask that guy down the hall, and I went and asked that guy, and he said, he gave me an answer, and when I did a little homework, I realized he didn't know either. That's how booming it was. So what I did is I made the conscious decision to go from a manufacturer, a company that makes the equipment that's installed on the bottom of the ocean, to go to work for an oil company. So they're the ones that own it and run it and live with it and use it and that. And I said, I'll go do that. I'll learn about it. I'll go back to the manufacturer. I'll be the most valuable employee they ever had. Because I'll be the one guy that everyone goes to. How is this used? Why is it used? How, what's good about it? What's bad about it? That sort of thing. Well, I went to work for Conoco, and, and then the, the biggest bust in the industry hit. So rather than go back to that manufacturer, I held on for dear life. I entered the project part of the oil business as opposed to the drilling part and, and have maintained that, that kind of job. So I did one project after the other. I've lived all over the world. I've worked all over the world. My children have been educated all over the world. Uh, I've got to experience lots of things and be responsible. Where I am now in my career, I moved to Hess a few years ago because of the opportunity. I'm now in a central technology role, so rather than being totally hands-on, I'm hands-on from having already been hands-on. So I'm the guy that's part of the reviews when we do 
projects and stop on a regular basis and say, are we where we should be as an engineer? Can we install it? And I'm the guy that asks those difficult questions, for example, and says, how are you going to move it? How are you going to install it? How are you going to add to it? How are you going to maintain All those things that when you're in the middle of it. And then I help develop new technologies. I look at where we're drilling and exploring and where we might need new equipment in the future and then go and find companies that do that and make sure my company is ready and knowledgeable about that so they can do it. So, so my career evolved from equipment supplier to user, and now I'm back from the living in the project world, living offshore, to now I'm in this advisory position. And all of those options are open to you. And as Peter said, the training, I mean, these are two guys a year plus out of school, and their company says, please go share what you know with the, with the world. I mean, there's not a lot of industries that would let two guys take half a day off on pay and come here and do this. It's, it's the attitude of our industry. And I'm, I'm not trying to sell it as though it's better than anything else, but I just want to make sure you have a fair understanding of what, what is in fact out there. So I guess with that, that's, that's us. We're, we're happy to answer any questions. We have the Sea Tiger here that uh, um, is drivable. Now this, this is in its um, stage mode. It's, it's, um, we've got some wheels and stuff on it. These guys are the senior design project for the foundation built a trailer mounted tank called 1400 gallons. We normally throw that in the water and it swims around and does all sorts of stuff. But if, if, if one of you guys, I don't know how we pick. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, if the first one that asks a good question, um, you can come up and fly it if you want. And then, uh, but, but open to any and all questions. Any, any one of the three of us. Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, okay, so uh, you said whenever you put the wires in and you set them on the uh, ocean floor, so it holds up the place and it wants How do you keep the fishes from not eating it? Well, the question was how do we keep the fish from eating the wires and stuff? Well. It's all material selection. I mean, there will be, we'll use coatings when you say fishes. We'll use certain coatings on the hulls and stuff to keep barnacles and bugs and stuff. We do a lot of cleaning and that sort of stuff. But mainly it would be um, selection. Now we have a case where we offload from one floating ship shape thing to another one. And the hose we use floats. And I have a picture of a swordfish stuck in one of those hoses. So you, you never know what might happen. But it would probably be for material selection. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have anything to do with the drilling, or is it just laying the pipes? The, I, when I went to the Conoco, I went into drilling. And drilling basically does the vertical work. They drill the hole and line it with steel. And then they put pipes inside it, which is called completion. And that's how we manage the oil and gas coming out, or the water going in. A lot of times we inject water to keep the pressure in the reservoir up so the oil will keep flowing. The drilling and completion bridge does that. But the tree, the equipment that's on top of it, that, that structure to the left sits on top of the well. And the project team tends to engineer that, but the drilling guys install it. So we work very closely with them. But it's a it's a broad mix. If you, you ask anyone my age in our industry, and they'll have done multiple things. Maybe some of the scientific guys that are on that side that love corrosion or love um, chemical properties and flow assurance and the property of making the oil stay liquid and that, some of them will stay in their track. But most everyone else sort of bounces all around. So the answer is yes and no. I can be more vague in a couple of times. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. How do you seek out places like this when we're in college? 
Right, so the question he was asking was basically, you know, as high school students, what can you be doing to prepare yourself and seek out jobs uh, in the sub industry like we've been talking about? And, you know, really there's a lot of things you can do because there's a lot of things that go into being a sub engineer. There's some of the obvious stuff we've talked about, like math and science, and those kind of form a, a the background of your engineering degree that you would uh, go into in college. There's other ways to get into the sub industry besides an engineering degree, but you really have the most options available to you with an engineering degree for a university. So work on a strong background in math and science, but it's not just math and science. It's writing and communications and dealing with people as well, because you know, on the project like Chico Bells that you saw the animation of, there's hundreds of companies with thousands of engineers all working on that together. And they all kind of interface and overlap with what they're responsible for. So I guess kind of on a personal level, I can tell you kind of where I went. So in high school, I worked in uh, kind of retail jobs. I worked at the Lowe's hardware store in the lumber department, kind of helping people learn how to build projects and plug things to people and interfacing with people. And I credit that with a lot of my ability to talk to people on the job. There's other things I did in college like go-to presentations that companies give on campus. There's usually free food in the ball, so you really can't lose. And, uh, so just learn about the companies, and primarily a lot of the companies I saw were talking about drilling. And I was like, okay, that kind of interests me, but what's that equipment that they keep showing in these pictures but don't talk about? I want to learn more about that. So I researched it on my own in college. And the biggest thing you can do in college they call internships or co-ops. And that's basically your summer job is aligned with your career path. So a couple of examples that have nothing to do with some sea engineering that I did was I worked in an environmental engineering permitting office. So I did permits submitted to the state and federal government on uh, pollution emissions and things like that. And that was really just a stepping stone for my next internship which was working at a chemical plant uh, in the maintenance department, dealing with all the equipment and things like that. And I used that as another stepping stone on my resume to get towards Chevron, where I interned. Uh, did an internship there, and they liked my work, I liked them, so they liked me full time, and that's kind of how I ended up at Chevron where I am. So I, I hope that's, that's probably a lot more detail than you were expecting, but I hope it answers your question. Here, Peter's got some more to say. See how, uh, see you guys how I got into oil and gas. Uh, up to junior year of college, I had no interest in going to oil and gas. I had no reason why. I guess it's just the way we have betrayed it and all that, but I just avoided it. Uh, my summer year of junior uh, semester, summer, summer, summer of junior year, uh, I interned as an air separation plan. I had nothing to do with oil and gas. Uh, senior year comes by, and so the Tyvek Foundation built a sponsoring a senior design project uh, related to oil and gas, and that was to build the SeaTac exhibit to use it for events like this. Uh, and just from there, the year I worked on this this project, just opened my, my doors to an industry that I had no idea about, uh, the details that, that went into you know just producing oil and gas, and that's really what interested me. Another piece of advice uh, to, to add on to what Brian said earlier was in college, uh, every semester you have a career fair. Uh, my advice would be to just, even if you're not looking for an internship, go to learn about different companies, to learn about what they do, uh, more importantly, learn how to communicate with recruiters. Um, you mentioned earlier how you traveled to Brazil. Does being in mechanical engineering require a lot of traveling? So that's very flexible on uh, your preferences. If you want to stay in an office, uh, you have the option to do so. I would say it's a lot better if you're more flexible. Although with the oil and gas industry, you know, the, there's plenty of positions for everyone. So that you're, you know, you're, if you want to stay in one place, you can. If you want to travel. Um, what just to share, there's, 
there's an adage that says the first law of negotiating is you never get more than you ask for. So to answer a lot of these questions, go ask. Go look up in any industry, not just petroleum. Go look at these industry societies and events and call the, 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 the board members and just say, I'm a student, or, or, can I come to one of your meetings? I, I don't know of one that wouldn't say, well, students are supposed to pay, but I'll buy it for you and take it And go sit down and just listen to what's talked about and meet people. The cool thing about it, the guy you're sitting next to that you don't know from Adam, that you introduce yourself and be polite and dress well, he'll remember, That's, that was an aggressive kid there. Right? That's the kind of kid that, I want to hire that. So in addition to learning about that, you'll, you'll put yourself in a position where if, if the front row was all equal and I'm interviewing, there'll be some characteristic of one of you that I'll remember. Go find that make that happen. And make it part of learning, answering those questions about what opportunities are out there. Go to the aerospace meetings. Go to other things that you're in mechanical. And just learn. Any other questions? What, how are we doing on time? Or? We have a website called subseatiebackfoundation.org. Um, go there. We're, we're doing some updating. We've had some membership change and some of that. But if you, if you have any further questions, contact us. You can get us through the, the advisors here at the school. And, uh, and I guarantee any of us would be more than willing to uh, Conference and chair. Also on Facebook. So search for Sea Tiger Exhibit or just Sea Tiger. Yeah, so look for Sea Tiger Exhibit on Facebook and we post a lot of pictures on the events we do. What I'd like to do, I just want to close and reinforce what, what Ryan said. Though this is a technical sort of group, engineering bias and stuff, if you invent something and can't describe it or write about it, converse with people or connect with people to learn what they need. I'm not hiring them. Me, not Don, me, the industry. I mean, do what your parents said and study it all. Learn well-spoken English. Learn presentations. Do a good job. Go to Toastmasters. Take some classes. Learn to write well. Learn political science. Not to be an expert in it. Just to be able to at lunch, when the president of the company walks in and he's talking about it, you can join in that conversation. But, but don't think that you can be a success by just being the best at engineering or math or this or that. Be as well-rounded as possible. It, it'll only be to your benefit. So is that us?